Greetings, my fellow renegades. I'd like to help set the record straight about home humidification because I've seen some misguided thinking about this subject that can lead to potentially dangerous consequences. Of course, when I say humidification, I mean adding water vapor to the air to increase its humidity. In various places on the internet, I've been seeing buzz about the importance of keeping relative humidity, or RH, between 40 and 60%. From a building science perspective, that recommendation is not only too general, but it's also not always safe. Welcome to the Healthy Home Guide. This is a place where I share practical, budget-friendly tips for creating a safe and healthy home, whether the word home refers to your house or your body. Please go ahead and like this video and subscribe, especially if you feel that more people should be aware of the information I'm sharing. First, where does that 40 to 60 RH range even come from? Well, it comes from several research studies since this one from 1986, but in recent years, a lot of the 40 to 60 messaging comes from this groundbreaking study by Stephanie Taylor et al. This study investigated the preventative role of indoor climate management for infection control in hospitals. Here's a quick background before I talk about the study. At least 10% of patients who enter an inpatient healthcare facility for treatment develop a healthcare-associated infection, or HAI. 100,000 people die of these annually in the U.S. alone, so HAIs are a huge problem. 10 to 30% of HARs are thought to be airborne and are therefore potentially influenced by indoor environmental factors. So, in this study, the factors Taylor et al. measured were temperature, RH, CO2 concentration, illuminance, and occupancy. Of these factors, RH below 40% was the most significant driver of HAIs. This graph shows that the number of HAIs decreased when average RH was kept just above 40% and increased when RH was around 32%. So that's clearly an amazing finding, and I have a ton of gratitude and respect for the researchers because these findings could save many lives if applied properly. Notably, though, this paper suggests applying the 40 to 60% RH range not only to hospitals, but to residential buildings as well. And that's where I come in. So should we all just run out and buy a humidifier and crank it up to 40, 50, 60% RH? So I'm a translational scientist, which means that I make decisions about how to practically apply research findings for a living. So because of that, I'm uniquely qualified to answer that question. I'll start by discussing the limitations of this study. So first thing I wanna note is that though this paper heavily touts the 40 to 60% RH range, it only seems to have presented data at just above 40% RH. But that's actually beside the point. I just wanted to mention it for comprehensiveness because I thought I might get comments. There is other research involving the 40 to 60 range, such as this 1986 paper. So let's assume that 40 to 60% RH is optimal for decreasing the spread of infectious microorganisms because I think that's reasonable enough. Here's the thing though, okay? 40 to 60 is a huge range. It may present as an optimal range in heavily controlled research settings, but not every RH level in that range is safe in every home, in every season, or in every climate. There is far more to indoor air quality than infectious bacteria and viruses though they are an important part of it. We need to be careful when using a humidifier because adding too much moisture to the air can lead to structural damage and can cause other hazards such as mold, mycotoxins, and VOCs to slowly build up over time. So how exactly do humidifiers cause mold growth? Well, when it's cold outside and your home isn't properly insulated or isn't airtight, air containing water vapor from inside your home can come in contact with surfaces that are colder than dew point temperature, causing moisture to condense on those surfaces. So humid air in your house might leak behind your walls, come in contact with something that's cold, and then that thing gets really wet. This can lead to toxic mold growth, which can dramatically impact health. Evidence from numerous epidemiological studies and analyses by the World Health Organization, the Institute of Medicine, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention showed indoor dampness or mold were consistent associated with increases in multiple diseases, including eczema, asthma, nasal allergies, bronchitis, and respiratory infections. Further emerging research suggests that mold can cause even more illnesses than the ones I mentioned. 
I myself am still recovering from severe mold illness. So it does happen to people, many more than you might think. And many people aren't even aware that mold exposure could be contributing majorly to any illnesses that they have. David Fontaine, a systems engineer who is chair of the Scientific Outreach Committee at Change the Air Foundation, will now share some information with us. Yeah, thanks, Alex. For starters, I'd like to make it clear that toxin-producing molds really aren't unicorns. They're common. In fact, they're kind of the natural end state, if you think about it, as mold toxins or mycotoxins, as they're more technically called, are, are used for a competitive advantage, meaning the longer water damage is present, the more likely toxigenic molds are to come to dominate in the environment. This really isn't conjecture. It's very clear if you look at the mold prevalence data from HUD's American Healthy Home Survey. Um, this was a study, the most recent one in 2019, it was a study of 700 homes from across the country that were selected as being representative of our uh, U.S. housing stock. And uh, while we're kind of led to believe that black mold is kind of a rarity, black mold or stachybotrys actually showed up in one third of the homes that HUD had sampled. Um, and worse yet and more alarming, uh, there were eight other toxin producing molds uh, that showed up in anywhere from 50 to 100% of the homes that were sampled. Wow. I mean, th think of that. Um, and, I, and I will say that, you know, when I've presented this information to folks in public health as part of our advocacy work, uh, generally, they're they're stunned. They they don't realize that this problem has grown as large as it is, or that the toxicity is is as significant as it is. So basically, you're saying that the vast majority of homes likely have one or more species of mycotoxin producing mold, which is just staggering. And on the subject of mycotoxins, I'll ask you: Is there scientific evidence that mycotoxins can affect health? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as far as the health impacts of mycotoxins go, there's really almost a bottomless well of peer reviewed research uh, on their health effects. A lot of this stuff comes from the agricultural domain, where the impacts of mycotoxins, like in contaminated feed, uh, have a direct impact on bottom line profits. But before we get to that, um, I think it's worth discussing a little bit about the routes of exposure, um, right? Because there's a lot of emphasis placed on foodborne exposure, uh, which is why the USDA regulates the presence of mycotoxins in some of our food products. Um, but there's somewhat of a reluctance to acknowledge the real risk of indoor mycotoxin exposures from water damaged buildings, uh, which right. I, I say is a, it's a little bit of a ruse. You know, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that when you think about indoor exposure risk, it's probably greater than foodborne exposure, even if you just look from the perspective of routes of exposure. Um, you know, indoor, indoor exposure is really, it's a combination of inhalational exposure, right, as you breathe the stuff in. Um, but then this naturally leads to GI exposure as though you've eaten the stuff, right? Think right. most nasal, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, stuff that ends up in your sinuses will end up in your gut. In addition, when you think about the nature of mycotoxins, they're very small molecules. And most of them, if you look at the research, they're capable of entering our systems uh, right through our skin. Uh, dermal exposure to mycotoxins is, is another legitimate route. So when you, when you think of all of that, obviously, if you're living in an environment where you have mycotoxins um, all around in the air, in your dust, on your surfaces, um, the potential for the exposure is, is, is really, really great. Wow, that's staggering. So they don't just enter our bodies through our eating foods that are contaminated with them. They enter through our sinuses, through our skin, uh, many different routes. Wow. And so what yep. can happen in our bodies when these mycotoxins enter our bodies? Is there evidence about that, research about that? Yes, indeed. There's a, a very large body of evidence. If you look at mycotoxins as a general class of chemicals, you'll find that they can impact virtually every body system, um, our digestive systems, nervous system, skin, eyes, livers, kidneys, reproductive system, um, you name it. 
as we've been looking at this, there are really plausible connections to a wide range of our common chronic diseases, um, cancers, autoimmune conditions, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, leaky gut and other GI conditions. Wow. Uh, the Change the Air Foundation, we just recently completed a piece on this called Conception to Grave, which includes 60 or so peer-reviewed references and shows how mycotoxins can be involved in health effects everywhere from fertility and reproductive health all the way to the diseases that we see typically in our elder years uh, that are that are becoming really problematic parkinson's alz um, als wow um, you know there's there are plausible connections to pretty much all of that if you if you look at the effects of mycotoxins and what's established in literature that is like beyond mind blowing. I mean, I think a lot of people might might hear this and they might think, oh, wow, that's so, so terrible. I feel so scared and sad about that fact. And one thing I want to put out there is that there's so much you can actually do to reduce your exposure to mycotoxins. And that's a big part of what my channel can help you all do. And one of the things you can do is be careful about humidifying as I discussed in this video. So thank you, David, so much for joining us and back to the video. So the question that many of you came for, what is a safe RH threshold during heating season? Well, RH doesn't even have to be that high for problems to arise. Here's a quote from building scientist Dr. Allison Bell's book, A House Needs to Breathe or Does It? Trying to stay above 40% can lead to moisture accumulation and mold growth in cold climate homes with weak building enclosures. Another quote from his Energy Vanguard blog, if you go up to 45% RH in a cold climate, you're pushing your luck unless you have a really good building enclosure. A really good enclosure would be like a passive house, which most of us do not have. Bales isn't the only one who cautions about high RH in the winter. According to ASHRAE, a risk factor for excessive dampness that could impact health is an indoor dew point temperature above 45 degrees Fahrenheit during heating season in moderately cold and mixed climates. That's climate zones four and five. Assuming your home is heated to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, as most homes are, that translates to an RH upper limit of 40%. So notably, ASHRAE gives the minimum standards and even they say it's unsafe to go above 40%. So how's 40 to 60 looking now? In very cold climates, such as zones six through eight, that RH upper limit should be about 30%. In warmer climates, RH can be higher, up to 50%, assuming your home is no warmer than 70 degrees Fahrenheit, because surfaces don't get as cold. So what should you do if the air in your home is uncomfortably dry? For many people, that would be below around 30% RH. Well, first you should know why it's so dry in the first place. Well, I'll tell you the reason. The reason is invariably because there's a lack of air sealing in your building enclosure, which causes dry winter air to leak inside and lower RH in your house too much. Using a humidifier to increase RH masks the symptom, but doesn't treat the cause. In addition, it puts you at risk for some nasty side effects, as I discussed. Sealing air leaks is not only the healthiest option, it will also save you money in the long run. I try to understand what you guys are looking for when you click on these videos, and I'm sure many of you are still looking for safe humidifier recommendations. So let me first tell you what to avoid at all costs. Avoid ultrasonic, aka cool mist humidifiers, which are unfortunately the most widely available. Here's a quote about cool mist humidifiers from a Dr. Deterting in a Colorado Children's Hospital article. Bacteria, chemicals, minerals, mold. Ultrasonic humidifiers aerosolize all that stuff to the right particle size that you breathe it right into your lungs and it can be toxic. Some say you can safely use distilled water in cool mist humidifiers, but I'm not sure that eliminates the risk of them vaporizing stuff you don't want to breathe. Years ago, I myself got this weird lung infection that I suspect was from the cool mist humidifier I was using at the time. My infection stuck around for almost two months and it went away when I stopped using the humidifier. I ain't saying nothing. I know, I feel like I'm the environmental illness sacrifice or something. My slogan should be getting environmental illness, so you don't have to. Ultimately, if you do choose to humidify, which I know most of you will, 
First, make sure you get a hygrometer, which is a little device that tells you the temperature and RH in your home. Do not trust the humidifier setting to keep your home below the RH threshold I discussed earlier. I personally don't use a humidifier at all, but if I absolutely needed one, here's what I'd get. If I were doing a high quality whole house install, I'd get a fully modulating steam humidifier. As far as a portable room humidifier, the Vornado EVAP 40, an evaporative humidifier, has a good reputation. It definitely does require regular filter changing and cleaning though, so don't forget that. Steam and evaporative are much safer than ultrasonic as they don't vaporize harmful particles as readily. Some alternatives to humidifying are again, that you can seal air leaks in your building enclosure, use saline nasal drops, skin moisturizers, or my favorite tip, drink lots of water throughout the day and eliminate processed foods, caffeine and alcohol entirely. No cheat days. I find that my skin and sinuses don't get nearly as dry since I started eating exclusively real food in 2017. I've also been sober for many years. Anyway, sorry if I got a little off topic. Now I'm gonna tell you an unfortunate truth about RH. RH is a wildly misleading measure of humidity. Dew point temperature is much better. The amount of water vapor in the air at a fixed RH varies dramatically at different temperatures. I'll explain with a quick example. There are two spaces. Both spaces have an RH of 50%. One space is 85 degrees Fahrenheit and the other is 68 degrees. Even though RH in both spaces is 50%, the hotter space contains almost twice as much water vapor. Now the dew point tells you this. The dew point of the hotter space is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite humid, and the dew point of the cool space is 49 degrees, which is fairly dry. So dew point tells you how humid it is and RH doesn't. See why it's irresponsible to shout 40 to 60 from the rooftops without caveats? If it's much warmer than 70 degrees in your house, even 50% RH can be uncomfortable comfortably humid. 60% RH can be downright oppressive, and yet it's in this 40 to 60 range that people are touting. How can you tell people that 60% RH is part of an okay, healthy range when if it's warm in their house, that would be oppressively humid. There are very knowledgeable, informed people recommending the 40 to 60% RH range. So I'm not saying that these people are dumb. I think they're often implying that we should improve our buildings so we can keep RH in that range. And I agree with them. You know, that's probably true, but they're also being idealistic to the point that they're missing the practical reality that in this moment, right now, and for the foreseeable future, our buildings cannot safely support 40 to 60. Anyway, if you want to learn more about why we need to stop using our age, check the description for a link to a video I made about dehumidification after you finish watching this. Another limitation of the Taylor paper is that the measured environmental factors did not include ventilation or filtration as far as I can see. The fact of the matter is, many other studies have identified contaminated air and ventilation system deficiencies as the main cause of HAIs. Again, though, I don't mean to take away from the impactful findings of the Taylor paper. I just want to help you realize the broader context. There is more to this story than RH when it comes to disease transmission. So what are some good ways to prevent disease transmission? Well, according to numerous building scientists, as well as good scientific research, ventilation and filtration are the safest and most effective ways to decrease infection risk in homes. The best practice is to ventilate with an energy recovery ventilator or ERV and to filter with at least a MERV 13 filter, but HEPA is best. If you're really concerned about viral transmission within your home, you should first present viruses from entering your body in the first place. There is one super effective way of keeping viruses out of your body. It's to wear a mask in crowded public indoor spaces, of course. Contrary to popular belief, wearing a mask is not a political statement. I don't care what your political beliefs are. Masks work. At this point, a lot of post-pandemic research supports their efficacy, and it's not up for debate anymore. Anecdotally, I will say this, for my entire life, up until the pandemic, I used to get sick multiple times a year, but I have not gotten sick since the beginning of the pandemic when I started wearing a mask. That's the only change I made in my life. Coincidence? Anyway, sorry, I'm going off on tangents. 
back to the limitations of this paper. So I think we need to be careful to remember that the experiment was conducted in a hospital, not a home. Hospitals are obviously very different from homes, from the state of the people within them to their environments. Here's a quote from the paper itself. HAIs occur in an environment of biological extremes coexisting within limited physical space. Vulnerable patients often have decreased immune defenses, and microorganisms can be more virulent than pathogens found outside the hospital. So let's all try to be mindful of the context of research before we hastily extrapolate findings and humidify the living daylights out of our homes. To summarize all that, research may suggest that a relative humidity range of 40 to 60 percent can decrease disease transmission. However, humidifying to increase relative humidity to 40 to 60 is not appropriate in every home or in every climate, and doing so can create other hazards, such as mold growth that can cause severe illness as well. It's better to seal air leaks in one's home before one considers humidifying. All in all, minimizing disease transmission is extremely important, especially in healthcare facilities. But when attempting to control our environments, we must be mindful of the constellation of factors that comprise the interactions between our buildings, the air inside them, and our bodies. And you can quote that. Isn't that right, Ricky? Isn't that right? <laughs> anyway, like this video and subscribe for more content like this. Please comment as well. And could you tell me what your humidification protocol is and if it's going to change after watching this video. If you're able to donate to my channel, please do so at the link at the bottom of the description. And finally, my fellow renegades, I salute you.